And welcome everybody to the Gym Masters Show Live. How are all of you? Hope you're having a good Monday. If you're not, well, you found the right spot. This is a place for inspiration, positivity, lots of levity and levity on the Gym Masters Show Live, a word that we sort of created a couple of months ago by accident and a word that truly and appropriately labels this show in a really positive, good, cool way. I love that word, levity. All of our levities are watching right now. This is a show where we celebrate each other, we celebrate life, we celebrate our accomplishments, and we celebrate great guests as well. Again, this is a show where it's styled as a television show, an entertainment lifestyle television program, sort of like the old school talk shows you may remember, the Dick Cavett's, David Suskind's, Carson's, uh, Jack Parr's, Mike Douglas, uh, Irv Griffin type of style, where we have real, really good conversations. Sometimes we go deep as well. We're bringing back the lost art of conversation as well, and terrific entertainment and great segments that are unique and special. So every show is something different, and we continue to tweak and fine tune and grow and expand. And boy, do we have some really cool and exciting things that we are continuing to work on with this series and with all of you here and all of the love that's happening and all the great comments and the Facebook messages and Instagram messages and all the posting and the sharing. We're working hard behind the scenes, but you guys are working quite hard as well. You're telling us about different guests you'd like to see on the show. You're telling each other about the show. You're telling your family and friends and, um, that makes a world of difference. We have a very, boy, do we have a lot of guests coming on in December too. Uh, some of our weekends, we have two shows a day and lots of great holiday themes coming up as well. We're so excited. Last night, we had the extraordinary Melissa Manchester as our very special guest for an extended and exclusive conversation. And so many of you have told me that uh, you've loved it. I know Melissa really did. I did. And uh, a lot of people in the industry were just saying how much this was really a special moment uh, when we were on together. And then John Lloyd Young, the brilliant Tony and Grammy winning actor and singer was on the night before. What a weekend, huh? And uh, we have so many great guests coming up, including tonight, we have Gabriel Barry. He is a noted actor as well as international director. He is responsible for so much incredible content and productions and Broadway and internationally and so much more. We've got a wonderful show in store for you as well. So we invite you to kick back and get that cup of coffee or tea or drink or water, whatever it is, your beverage of choice and uh, join us for a great conversation and a great episode. Of course, we love all of our viewers and our loveties, so we welcome all of you, and we toast all of you as well. We always toast all of you. We have our fancy glass today, but once again, nothing more powerful in it than Trader Joe's Pink Lemonade. <laughs> mm. But it is so refreshing too, really. Very busy day here. We have booked seven more guests. We are almost filled with January guests already, which is amazing. So many people are approaching us to come on the show. They're watching the shows. They're binge watching. They're checking it out. They love the style, the format, the vibe. Uh, and I really appreciate that. Again, a lot of you know I do this work professionally in television and radio as a, as a host, presenter, personality, writer, producer, journalist, actor, voiceover artist, TV and radio personality. Been doing this work for years, stage MC, and we created this show 30 weeks ago, 30 as of today, 30 weeks, well over 200 episodes, just about day after day. And it's absolutely amazing. Let's say hello to some of our viewers, or as we call them, Lovities, and welcome them here to Lovity Hall. Then we'll welcome our very special guest, Gabriel Barry, in just a second, live and direct from New York City. Christine Clifton is here. Greetings, Jim and Lovities. We welcome actor, director, Gabriel Barry to the show tonight. Looking forward to a great conversation in Lovity Hall. Great to have you with us as always, Christine, one of our great Lovities, North Carolina, USA. Mary Bishop is here as well. Hello, Jim and the Lovities. Great to see you, Mary. As always, they're in Florida. Chiming in from Cleveland, Ohio. Kathy Short is here. Happy Monday, Jim and Lovities from Cleveland. Good to see you as well, Kathy. Hello, Lovities. So happy to be back here at Lovity Hall with you again tonight. And we're very happy to have you here, Sherry. The best people are right here with all of us because there's so much. This is a wonderful community that we have created. And so many of the guests say that too. They really 
see the comments. They feel the vibe. They all ask to come back. As soon as we wrap up, they're like, oh my God, that didn't feel like that amount of time. When can we come back? And, and I really appreciate that. Good to see you, uh, Sharon Demaria, and happy Monday to you as well there in Connecticut. Wonderful Merlin is here. Hi, Jim. Welcome all. Lovely. It's good to see you as well. I love your uh, profile photo. It's very, very festive. And I know you got four inches of snow there, huh? In uh, the Ontario area. Well, remember I said to you earlier today when we were chatting, I said, keep it north if you can. <laughs> Send it to us on Christmas Eve. Send it from Canada uh, down our way Christmas Eve. That would be really nice, Merlin. You're a little bit closer to Santa Claus and the North Pole where you are in Canada. So maybe you can talk to Santa, have them ship the uh, snow our way, maybe Christmas Eve. Good to see you there in wonderful Canada, Merlin. And Wozniak is here. Hello, Jim and all lovely. So everyone had a great weekend. Absolutely a very busy one. And I was on the air with several shows on Close Up Radio as well today. I was actually interviewing uh, a very renowned and noted immigration attorney uh, live and direct from Los Angeles in my professional work today. And that was a really riveting and interesting conversation. Really amazing, eye opening. Hello, Jim and all loveties. Good to see you, Anne and Christopher Joseph. Hello, Jim and all loveties. Checking in from Ohio, Juanita, South Africa. Hello, Jim and all of the lovely loveties. Good to see you as well. Juanita. We're right now on our Facebook page at Gym Masters TV. We're also on our YouTube channel right now, concurrently at Gym Masters TV. Maureen, it's great to see you here, and I'm so glad you're loving our shows. Thanks for all your great comments. Happy Monday. Love it ease. Kathleen Walker in New York City. Hi, Jim. Hope you had a good day. Hi, everyone. Good to see you as well. Hello to all from Marsha Murphy Watson. Wonderful to have you here. Happy Monday, Mr. Lovety. So excited to meet your guest this evening, Gabriel Barry. He's excited to be here as well. And it's really, really nice to uh, to see all of your happy faces. And thanks for all the cheers as well. All the very wonderful uh, loveties are here. And again, Carla is here from South America and from Brazil. Hello, Jim and gang. 34 weeks ago, an incredible show. 34 weeks ago? Am I missing four weeks? Oh my God, I'll have to check back. If it's 34 weeks ago, I need a break. <laughs> Marilyn Hammond, Wichita, Kansas. Hi, Jim and all our lovely. It's good to see you. you. Well, you're the viewer. I have to check. Maybe it is 34 weeks ago. Holy cow. Where's my trophy? <laughs> Love when you're with us, Carla, from beautiful Brazil. And you as well, Kathleen. And Claudio, Thanksgiving is coming. Yes. Can't wait for my mashed potatoes. <laughs> I love mashed potatoes. Hi, all lovelies. Our dear friend, June Rachelson Aspa in fabulous New York City. And the wonderful Lady Bane, who we love so much, who's coming back on our show in December for a special Christmas show. Yeah, she and I were talking. We're putting that together right now. Our fabulous Cassandra Bain, R&B sensation, who loved being on our show. We love her. And so many of you loved having her here. She's coming back in December. For, I'm going to do a special cool show and it's going to be great. Good to see you, Cassandra. And I love when she says, hello, beautiful people. Everybody loves her as well. It's going to be wonderful. Gabriel is wonderful. Absolutely. You got it. Welcome to everybody. And those who will be watching this later in the archives who aren't here live, we welcome you uh, as you watch this show uh, recorded. We're live right now, but we also archive it on our YouTube channel. Let me tell you about our illustrious guests. Uh, we'll continue welcoming everybody as the comments continue to flow in here. And we thank you for your comments and your inter interactivity. So many people have been saying they love how interactive uh, our audience is here, and I do as well. There is Gabriel, and it's uh, an honor to have him here. He's an American director and actor, best known for creating original musicals. His work has been seen on Broadway throughout the United States and across four continents internationally. Gabriel directed a, the Broadway production of Amazing Grace, which also toured the country. It was a sit-down production as the new Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. in 2019. It was there. And in New York City, he is known for his off-Broadway work. He directed the original production of Andrew Lippa's The Wild Party at the Manhattan Theater Club, starring Adina Menzel and Tay Diggs and Brian Darcy James and Julia Murney. He was awarded the Callaway Award for Best Direction, was nominated for five Outer Critics Circle Awards and 13 Drama Desk Awards too, both including Best Direction of a Musical. He directed the original production of John Cariani's Almost Maine at the Daryl Roth Theater, which has become one of the most frequent uh, produced plays in the United States with over 4,000 productions to date. And it has been translated into a dozen languages and recently unseated Shakespeare 
as the most produced play in North American high schools. Other off-Broadway productions include a new adaptation of uh, Cyrano de Bergiac's at the Simic Clements Theater using the Anthony Burgess translation, which was brought to life by a cast of only eight actors and featuring direction uh, by Gabriel, which uh, he also appeared in the leading role too. Really incredible. His uh, also, his direction is noted for original productions of the wonderful works of Summer of 42 at the Variety Arts Theater, Honky Tonk Highway at Don't Tell Mama, winner of the Mac Award and Bistro Award for Best Review, Stars in Your Eyes at the Cherry Lane Theater, and on and on. Nationally, he directed the U.S. national tour of Rogers and Hammerstein's Cinderella, starring Eartha Kitt, which performed at New York City's Madison Square Garden. It toured and played originally in the U.S. for three years. He's also directed the national tour of Pippin, which originated at the Goodspeed Opera House in Connecticut and played throughout the U.S. and Canada. And um, really incredible work. We're going to talk about uh, his illustrious career and so much more. But first, why don't we welcome him as our special guest, live and direct from New York City. Gabriel, welcome to the show. I know I just scratched the surface of your illustrious <laughs> career, but uh, but it is a beautiful career. And thanks for all of you done, that you have done to inspire us and, and make us happy and lift us up <laughs> through your work. And welcome to our show. Thank you, Jim. It is such an honor to be here. And hello, Lovities. I'm thrilled to meet you all as well. And um, congratulations on your anniversary, whether it's 34 or 30 <laughs> weeks. Either way, that's uh, quite an accomplishment. So you should all be very proud. I tell you, it's really amazing. It's it's my pleasure. And uh, <laughs> we have some wonderful, everybody is welcoming everybody here. And they're also welcoming you. Uh, <laughs> Lou Ellen, who's in Palm Springs, California area, says good afternoon. And Mary Bishop in Florida says, welcome, Gabriel. So get ready. Here comes the lovity wave coming your way. A flood of lovity. Kathleen. I feel it. I feel it. Yeah, yeah it's intense here on the show. Hi, Gabriel. Welcome. That's Kathleen in uh, New York City. Sherry says, welcome, Gabriel, to Lovity Hall. We can't wait to hear all your about your life and your career. Very happy you're here with us tonight. Merlin is here from uh, Interkip, Ontario, Canada. Welcome, Gabriel, to Lovety Hall. Already, that was quick. Only in, within, what, three minutes, you're already now a Luddy. <laughs> so welcome. And I told him all about Lovety, so he knows. I mean, there's Grammys, there's Oscars, there's Tonys, there's Tellys, there's Peabody's. But when you get a Lovety from the Jim Master <laughs> Show Live, it's the pinnacle, isn't it? <laughs> you can't get better. You can't get better. Uh, Maureen says, what a stellar career this man has had. Congratulations, absolutely. And that was just scratching the surface as well. Juanita, who's in uh, South Africa, saying welcome to the show, Gabriel. And Cassandra Bain, who's a brilliant R&B singer and sensation. Uh, she was a guest on our show as well. Welcome, Gabriel, from Cassandra, Lady Bain. Kathy Short in Cleveland, Ohio. Welcome, Gabriel, to the land of liberties. And Llewellyn, California. Welcome, Gabriel. And June, of course, a wonderful June. Hi there as well. Hello, so, John. Just a little a bit of a sample and lots more popping in here. Um, welcome. And Carolyn Copeland says, hi, Gabe. He is the best. XO, XO, OX. Uh, <laughs> Carolyn is one of the best producers in New York or anywhere. Mm, well, welcome to this show. It's really great to have you here. And I know we put this together a while ago. And uh, how have you been? You know, I, we were, you and I were chatting before we went live as far as, you know, how we're dealing with all the different uh, unusualness of this particular year. And uh, it, it's it, it's a year of pause. It's a year of soul searching. It's a year of reinventing and, and rebooting in many different ways too, and, and looking within ourselves. And I've been saying multiple times, and I was actually saying it to somebody I was interviewing professionally with my professional hat on earlier today about how I'm hoping that we rise from the ashes. And she said, oh my God, that's really what it is, rising from the ashes. Mm. More empathetic, more loving, kinder. We listen to each other more, we're less divisive, and we come together more unified and move forward because we've certainly been tested in so many different ways, physically, emotionally, financially, every which way you can think of. And I'm hoping that we do move forward in a collective way. Uh, and I think we might be headed in that direction. I hope so. <laughs> I, How about I, you? I hope so too, uh, Jim. I, I feel exactly the way you do. Uh, which is hopeful. Um, you know, obviously feel grateful too. I mean, obviously this 
uh, virus has touched so many people and uh, hurt so many people and extended uh, families of those people. And uh, so you can't help but feel grateful that we're still here um, and, uh, and um, getting through this, of course. Um, and as I was, as we were both talking earlier, I think it's, uh, you know, with, as with any twist or turn in, in one's life, uh, it's always important to look for the hidden uh, gems, the hidden messages, the hidden opportunities for, uh, for uh, growth in, in whatever direction uh, it may take you. And uh, um, certainly our experience, our meaning my family, uh, immediate family has uh, borne that out. Mm hmm. That's beautiful. That's fantastic. Jill says, so great to see you, Gabe. XO. You too, Jill. Hello. Watching it on YouTube channel. Anybody watching on the YouTube channel, give it a lovely subscribe. We would love that at Jim Masters TV. Bart Chateau, who was here, uh, I'd say about a month and a half, two months ago. Oh, hi, Bart. He great was a guest on the you. show. Yeah, he was here as well. We had a good time with Bart. Uh, Bernadette says, hi, Jim and Lovities. Welcome, Gabriel, to Lovity Hall. Christopher in Ohio says, welcome, Gabriel, to uh, Jim Masters Live. And uh, everybody's welcoming you. And I think that's really fantastic. So have you been creating? Have you been working through all of this time as well, Gabriel? Yes. I'm, again, very feel very fortunate to be able to say that. Um, we... Uh, as soon as uh, I have two boys, uh, one just turned 13 today. And Happy one birthday. <laughs> Thank you. His name is Tristan. And uh, my other boy, Holden, is turning 10 on Thanksgiving. Oh, so, fantastic. So, you know, and they're, they're New York City kids. They were both born here in our apartment. Um, my wife, Tricia, who's a wonderful actress and artist. Um, uh, and I'll tell you more about that later. But um, she uh, gave birth here in our, our apartment and... Uh, after that, I said, women should run the world. Yes. <laughs> because <laughs> Just the uh, fact that they can just, give birth just, and just, bear I, all I, that. I, yeah. I, I mean, we should just give it a try. Just let them do it all. That's, that's sort of my opinion right now. Right. Um, <laughs> but uh, we were very fortunate that in Trisha's, the, Trisha's family has a farm in California. And as soon as the schools closed down here in March, we all went out there. And we've been there uh ever since till, till September, they came back here. And I actually uh, just got back from two months in China where I'm working on a new project, uh, which is going to be opening in July of next year in full production. But we just came back from a five week workshop in Beijing mm -hmm. where things, believe it or not, are sort of back to normal there. Yeah, right. um, the, better than here, yeah. When I was uh, there, I had, had, they're very serious about the virus there as you, may have heard mm -hmm. or can imagine um and uh they don't fool around you get off the plane and you get put into a a bus and they take you to a hotel they don't tell you where you are or where you're going they don't tell your employer where you're going and you're in a hotel room for two weeks quarantining and then i was working in in beijing though in a rehearsal room with with actors and uh while I was in China there were there were more cases of covid in the white house than there were in all of china so yeah right it mm -hmm. tells you a little bit about where they're they're at. But I was very lucky um, with my family. We got to go out to California and uh, my uh, grandparents, or uh, rather my kids' grandparents, my uh, in-laws had a uh, small cabin they built in the, in the uh, uh, nearby hour and a half away from their farm. And it ended up being the perfect quarantine quarters for, for a family of four from New York City. <laughs> and so we got to uh, hole up there for a about six months, and it was, uh, it was again looking for the positive uh, in this experience for us. It, it's been a chance to actually come together as a family in ways we hadn't for a long time. I was right. out, of, out of the country a lot, so um, it's, it was really great to be, frankly, forced to be together in the same exactly. space, and and uh, we just loved it. Um, uh, Have you cleaned it, a lot of closets? We we <laughs> well, we baked we, a lot of bread. <laughs> yeah, there's all of that, and uh, that's been that's been exciting too. But um, other opportunities came up while we were there too. And you know, I work um, a lot on developing new uh, shows, and of right. course, uh, this period uh, while. There's obviously a, a tough 
situation in terms of presenting shows and and mm -hmm. and and uh, obviously we all long for being in a theater again with an audience which of course is the most important part of what we do is that uh, cycle of communication between an audience and the and the story you're telling but uh, in the meantime it is a great time to develop those stories and so that's uh, largely what i've been doing um uh, and have even gotten into uh, mining some opportunities to not only direct and help shepherd artistically some new projects, but also have a hand in writing some of them in terms of uh, adding to the, the books of some of these musicals and so on. And um, we even got to apply for a grant at the Florida Studio Theater, which had offered uh, grants for new projects. And um, my wife, Tricia, is a wonderful actress. She's been on Broadway a number of times and a wonderful singer. But one of her um, unique talents has always been that she's been able to uh, sing like Dolly Parton. And she even played that role in 9 to 5, the musical out in Sacramento, California, oh, summer before last. And uh, so we finally got, uh, we actually got a grant from Florida Studio Theater to develop a show where she got to, to play Dolly. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, and uh, I enlisted a good friend who I've worked with on other projects named Bruce Valanche, who's a well-known oh, comedy sure. writer from he California. He was a guest uh, about two months ago on the show. Oh, I, yeah. I believe it. He's, we had, it was a hoot of a time. We had a I, lot of he is a, He's a very funny man. So Bruce and I and Tricia wrote a two-person musical about Dolly Parton and a avid fan of Dolly's who's in quarantine and uses Dolly to work through some of the hard times in his life. We are waiting to get the grand rights <laughs> for the show to uh, to continue with it uh, and are hoping uh, that that happens. But regardless, it's actually, it was a fantastic experience to to, uh, to work together and, and uh, create a, a, a wonderful little gem of a show that we're hope, hope, hopeful can get out there someday. How did you first get started in, in the arts? You originally from the beautiful state of Vermont in Northern New England. Tell us about some of the background and maybe some of those influences that you had early on growing up in Vermont that pointed you in the direction of the arts. Well, that's, thank you, Jim, for asking that. Um, well, um, First, one of the things that, uh, in terms of my growing up, which was really influential, was my dad, of course. Uh, he was a preacher, uh, an Episcopalian preacher. My parents were both quite young when I was born, 19 and 20 years old. Hard to imagine <laughs> myself. Yeah. Um, uh, I was certainly older when my parents, kids were born. Um, uh, and my dad was still in high, uh, college, rather, and... Um, he became a priest. We moved around quite a bit. So I think that contributed to my, you know, adaptability to the new environments and so on. And it also made me uh, realize pretty quickly what my, my special ingredient to get uh, new friends in any new place I moved, whether it was New York City for seminary when my dad was in seminary or back in Vermont when he was preaching, uh, would be to be a bit of a class clown, I'm afraid. And so I always found I could make new friends quickly through humor. And yeah. so that's, I guess, where it started. I then started doing uh, drama in high school and through the wonderful social media platforms, which you know all too well, Jim, um, the power of, of, of the reach uh, of that when I had a show off Broadway and was just beginning uh, my directing career. Uh, Lo and behold, a drama teacher that I had in high school, Ernie Cabrera, um, reached out and found me, and uh, we got back in touch. And, and uh, he was a big influence on me when I was in high school. You know, just he was very devoted to the drama program, as you have to be if you're an English yeah. teacher in a high school. You're anyway, right. absolutely. And, and I picked up on that passion, of course, and 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 shared it immediately. Uh, we would all all of us made the sets and did everything and learned every aspect of it and. He was a, a really wonderful influence on me. And uh, when I was faced with a decision about where to go to school, um, one of the opportunities I pursued is an audition for the American Academy of Dramatic Arts here in New York City. And because I had spent a few years here when I was quite young, I was uh, that probably helped to dispel any immediate trepidation or fear I had about moving from a small state like Vermont to New York City. So that probably helped. And uh, was there any involvement at all? Did you go into Boston? Any 
involvement with theater or anything in Boston? Well, not years? directly because I was growing up in, in Vermont. And then be, as soon as I got out of high school, I did get accepted to uh, a few universities, but also to the Academy of Dramatic Arts. And I thought to myself, you know, what would I least regret 10 years from now or even one year from now? And the answer to that was, uh, I'm not going to regret trying to go to New York and just see what happened and 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 how how it affects me and so on. So lo and behold, of course, I come to New York and start my acting uh, classes. And uh, literally, I can I know exactly where I was standing on the street corner, 28th Street and Park Avenue, walking back to the subway after a, I don't know, third, fourth, fifth week of acting classes in New York City. And it's just hit me that I had all through high school and junior high had been interested in law. I'd been interested in medicine a little bit, but mainly uh, law and being a lawyer or being going into politics even. I didn't know what I wanted, but I was interested in all those things. And I realized that to be a good actor, you really had to be all those things. You had to be uh, make a good case for your character uh, as, a, as a lawyer. Yes. You, you had to no, be a doctor, meaning you had to understand the human condition or be at least curious about it. Exactly. Endlessly curious about it. And um, you had, you know, to be a, to strive to be a good artist, you had to notice everything and be, and be alert. And you had to obviously train your instrument, which was your body, your voice and, and so on. So I I immediately said, there's nothing else I can think of that would take every ounce and grain of who I am and every, uh, you know, uh, corner of my imagination the way working in the theater would. And that's sort of how it began. And I just uh, stuck with it, as as do all of us who who yeah. who, who have, have that bug. And, uh, you know, those other people that I've met over the years and so so many hundreds of them, as we all do in in this career. Uh, every one of those people sort of reaffirms, you know, the, the, that choice uh, because they're all wonderful people and, and uh, usually l people that I learn something from too, uh, whether I'm directing or acting in a show. Um, so, and I just love it. It never feels like work. Uh, it always feels like going into a rehearsal room for me is like uh, Christmas morning every, mm -hmm. every day. Every day, which is a beautiful feeling. It's a wonderful feeling. That means you're doing what you were meant to do. Uh, interesting and profound way to phrase that. Love it from Bernadette. That's true. Mm. And also a lot of comments about they're so excited about Dolly. <laughs> oh, she's a, she, she should run the world too. You know, by the way, she, she would, she, I'm sure she, she, uh, she's considered it. She should. Um, yeah. And she's having a, a very active fall and uh, yeah. she had a very exciting uh, show coming up. I can't wait to see myself. And uh, she's amazing. Um, isn't she? She's she, a she, national she, she treasure. Really, she um, is. That's a good way to put it. And uh, such a great role model and a mentor to others and has helped others and launched the careers of others and <laughs> no. revived the careers of some. And, and, and you just think, you know, she can't possibly do more. And then you hear like two days ago that uh, the she put a million dollars into Modern the Moderna vaccine. Of course, she's behind the, the, the vaccine that it's like, of course, it's why don't we just have her distribute it all? She will be and she'll get it done quick. That's it. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. She uh, she is a, a force. And Carolyn says, I met Gabe when he was playing a clown in the clown of God. I think he was a mute. He was brilliant. Oh, uh, that's an amazing uh, production, Carolyn's remembering. And uh it was uh really interesting little show that uh, played with a fantastic cast of, of actors who went on to become quite quite well known. Um, I played a, a mute as, as Carolyn alludes to. It's sort of a Jesus parable about a mute who joins a circus and affects all the people's lives in it and eventually is killed by, mm -hmm. by, the, uh, by his fellow performers. So it sounds a little dark, but it, but. It, actually was, it actually was an extremely uplifting show and um, reaffirming. And, uh, and uh, that led to, uh, you know, Carolyn then called to have uh, performed uh, in one of her shows. She ran the uh, wonderful Lambs Theater for many decades. Um, and, uh, and she ended up uh, producing the first show I ever directed, which was called John and Jen, also by Andrew Lippa. And that was uh, Carolyn produced the original production of that. I did the developmental production up at the Goodspeed Opera House, and that was mm -hmm. the first show I ever directed. And Carolyn saw it and 
nurtured it and uh, shepherded the piece to her theater in New York, where it played with Carol Lee Carmelo and Jim Ludwig, and uh, Michelle Pock later took over the role, and um, uh, it was uh, an amazing experience, the entire thing. Uh, working with Andrew, of course, was a dream, and, uh, and Carolyn uh, went on to produce many, many, many other shows, but they included uh, Amazing Grace that you alluded to earlier, uh, which uh, she also shepherded to Broadway and beyond. And uh, so I owe a lot to Carolyn. She's a dear person and dear friend. Mm. For you, uh, you know, when you came to the big city, um, what were some of those early breaks for you in the Big Apple? Here you are. You said, you know, I want to take a shot. I want to arrive in the big city and see what happens and I'll give it my all. What were some of those first opportunities for you, Gabriel, that really well, paid I would off? I would describe myself as a sponge on two legs when I got here. I was really just uh, absorbing it all, as most of us do when we move to New York the first time, especially if you're young. And uh, and I did that. I was really uh, took advantage of the campus uh, because uh, I knew I could go to university somewhere and get a great theater training and probably a good academic one as well. But here I was in New York studying theater, and we had classes for five hours a day, but that left quite a bit of the day free. And uh, so I decided to take advantage of that. And I worked, you weren't allowed to work as a performer while we were in school, but um, I did work as a stage manager, ran lighting boards, uh, met some amazing people doing off, off Broadway uh, uh, and learned a lot about the craft of putting a show together, whether it's with tin can lighting or, or uh, in a, in a bigger arena. And um, so that was sort of my first f formative uh, years here, uh, also saw as many shows as we could, um, and that was obviously educational every every time. Um, and then my first job was working as a puppeteer. I worked in the Muppets with the Muppets for a few things, and uh, and then I started training with a gentleman named. What Richard. was that like with the Muppets? That must oh, have been cool, huh? Well, I, I love puppets and puppeteering, and I worked as a professional puppeteer, and that included uh, a few stints with with uh, some of the Muppet movies and stuff. But I um, love puppets too. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Ventriloquism also, I love ventriloquist dolls. Oh yeah, that's that's quite a that's quite a, a unique skill. Um, never got into that, but I, I I've always appreciated it. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, and I love all of that sort of vaudeville and new vaudeville yeah. and clowning. Uh, that became a big part of my training as well, uh, circus skills. My first equity show was the first national tour of Barnum, in fact. So I got to put all my circus skills to, to good use and played the ringmaster in that uh, tour opposite uh, the wonderful D. Hody, who now lives in my building here, and, <laughs> and uh, Stacy Keach, who played uh. Uh, Barnum on the road. And he's... Uh, also a wonderful influence as an actor. So that was one of my, that was my first equity show. But prior to that, I worked with this gentleman named Richard Morse, who was really became my mentor in many ways. He's the brother of, of actor Robert Morse, mm -hmm. who you may have heard of. And Richard also had a distinguished Broadway career. He was in the uh, original production of Fiddler on the Roof uh, in its second or third year uh, of its five year run, the first, the first uh, production of that. And, uh, um, but uh, and left, a, I think, a seven year contract with Universal Pictures back when they did that to uh, study mime, which he did out in Paris. And then he came back uh, and he started blended his uh, training with um, uh, Lee Strasberg, the wonderful acting teacher, and his training with Attenda Crew, who was uh, Marcel Marceau's teacher. And he blended that and created his own sort of a what I what's been called an American form of of mime. Uh, this was back in the seventies and eighties when mime and and movement in general, ballet especially, was going through a huge uh, rebirth and resurgence. And uh, it was a really exciting time to be a part of his company, which I did for five or six years. And we performed at Lincoln Center together. And it also uh, ended up, uh, my first uh, sort of international experience came from that, where uh, we traveled through the Middle East and Europe, uh, performing as uh, um, sort of artistic or um, uh, liaisons or uh, cultural ambassadors uh, for uh, the United States. And there was a program back then that was sort of funded by, by the government that took American uh, acts, as it were, and 
we performed throughout the Middle East and some of, some of the troubled areas of the world, and they reciprocated, brought acts here as well. And it was a really, really fascinating ex experience and adventure. And I had never been on an airplane before <laughs> from Vermont. And so, <laughs> so here we were traveling through Afghanistan and, and Syria, performing in Aleppo and Damascus. And you probably were on... Good. And you were probably on more ski slopes uh, than airplanes <laughs> coming from Vermont, that's a, right? That, that's a good guess, and you're absolutely right. And the year before, the company had been in the Jerusalem Arts Festival, and so it was a really amazing way to see the world and to see firsthand and for the first time for myself how universal the human experience is and how theater, more than anything, can cut through all of that yeah. and, and that we can celebrate how we are all the same and the ways we're all the same. And right. to see people from a completely different culture and background laugh at the same things or cry at the same things is somehow reaffirming and reassuring. And I, I, you know, uh, I was one of millions of Americans, I'm afraid, that up to that point hadn't really been exposed to the rest of the world. And we, it, uh, the U.S. has a danger, I think, because of the way we're geographically structured, for one thing, we're separate. Only, yeah, we're separate, but but also just because of the of the how young we are as a country, yeah. and and you start to sort of realize when you travel outside the country wh where uh, how young we are, first of all, how arrogant we can be at times, um, and so on. Uh, so um, it was really eye opening, and uh, and. Uh, moving to me to experience that firsthand as a performer. And uh, we started then creating all the shows at the Th Mime Theater together. So Richard was a huge, huge influence. And coincidentally, he ended up uh, as after he left New York and began teaching at a small college in, in uh, St. Louis, he, uh, a young woman uh, was coming to New York and he recommended that she hook up with me, uh, meaning just be as a friend. Um, and she came to see me in a show. I was doing the first American production of a show called Return to the Forbidden Planet off Broadway, where I was the lead drummer in the show, wearing roller skates with silver makeup on my <laughs> face. Uh, and that was the first time uh, I met, uh, or uh, Trisha saw me, and we met for lunch uh, some, some weeks later, and uh, we became friends. And uh, then we got to perform in the play Cyrano de Bergerac, where I played Cyrano and she played Roxanne, and I proposed six months later on Martha's Vineyard, and mm -hmm. uh, we got married less than a year after we closed in that production, and we've been married for uh, 21 years now. So, so, uh, so you... Richard was, uh, was a, a big influence in my life, uh, especially. So there was two closings, the production and the <laughs> sealing the deal with the wedding. There was two closures yeah. that were made. <laughs> yeah, in a way, in a way. Martha's yeah. Vineyard, what a beautiful area too. To, uh, that is, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. So um, so things, you know, then really just took course from there, right? I mean, uh, once you really got your feet wet and all these wonderful things were starting to happen, people were really paying heed and noticing and, and more opportunities were continuing to come your way, right, Gabriel? Well, I don't know how many people were noticing, but I, <laughs> but I, I was so Besides fulfilled. mom and dad. Yeah, mom and dad, they would notice. Um, <laughs> I, but the important thing was I was just so uh, fulfilled uh, and I would always pride myself on keeping busy and I would do three or four different uh, shows at a time. And I remember getting involved uh, luckily on early versions of Stuart Ross's show Forever Plaid, which I was in the original cast of. And at the same time, I'd be doing uh, Shakespeare, The Tempest down at uh, the Roundabout Theater as an actor. And I'd get on my bike and ride up to Paulson's and do a midnight show of Forever Plaid. And then I'd, the next morning would have a school show where I was working with a flutist, going to public schools to make some money and doing a mime show. And and that was that was those were my days, and I would perform at bar mitzvahs on the weekends to make extra money as a mm. as a clown and a, a circus performer, and uh, so that was my life, and I, yeah. I I loved every minute of it, and I still do. I'm still yeah. very very fortunate about that. Absolutely, a couple of really cool comments. Jane, who was a guest on our show a few weeks back, her daughter's going to be joining us as well in I think about a week. 
Uh, hi, Gabe. Your performance and my production of Houdini influenced me to ask you to direct the musical, which you did brilliantly. I think that was your first big musical, which you directed. Bravo. Yeah, that's true. And Jane has been a wonderful influence as well and friend through the years. And uh, uh, that she, she remembers that accurately. And, mm -hmm. and uh, we had an amazing time with that really worthy show, which we did a few productions of at Goodspeed and out in Chicago. And uh, a really interesting character, which is you know the uh, has attracted other other writers over the years uh, that show but um uh, that subject matter i should say um but we had a really fantastic time with it and a show uh, that i still am quite proud of uh june says uh, you guys met through doug mm -hmm. doug's a wonderful composer and um uh friend and uh yes he's he's a uh, quite a talent and uh, a couple of other very crucial comments. The Muppets, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, did you work with Jim Henson? Uh, he was around, but I didn't get to work with him that intimately. Um, but uh, I it was still, it was, uh, it was a beautiful experience just to watch him and Frank Oz and others work. Uh, you realized, and may, maybe this shouldn't have been such a big surprise, but one of the things I remember uh, remarking on was how egoless uh, this the 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 set was um, because <laughs> after all they're not front and center they're th these other characters are and they to are. be a good puppeteer you really have to you have to give up yourself you I mean you really have to look through those eyes and really imagine being those characters whatever they are and to be in a room of people that are good at doing that are at good at forgetting who they are, forgetting themselves, I mean, in, in, in an ego way, um, was really refreshing, especially, you know, uh, actors, uh, very, very understandably, we have to, as an actor, have a really strong sense of yourself and a pretty good, healthy ego just to survive the, you know, the push and pull of the the practicalities of, of this business and then and the sheer sort of numbers and percentages of people that work etc so you have to it's a really interesting dichotomy as an actor you have to develop a thick skin to survive but a thin skin when you're on stage so that you really are sharing something with an audience and not just going through the motions you've got to really risk being in the moment and risking something of who you are out there on the stage and and yet you have to be insulate yourself in your day-to-day -day life just to yeah. deal with the rejection and the other the usual things. So it was interesting to to be in a room of puppeteers where <laughs> they're 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 used to just focusing on that character. And it was really beautiful to see the collaboration happen and the uh and I'm sure they had arguments and you know, I wasn't in the, all the writing rooms or anything, but um so I'm sure they had their trials and tribulations, but that was one of the takeaways I I I had. When you look at it, um, acting, directing, is there, does the pendulum swing more towards one versus the other as far as Gabriel, or do you love each equally? Thank you for that question. And, um, well, I, you know, one of the things I, I marveled at when as soon as I sort of left the nest and started uh, studying in, in New York, uh, and I think this is something we all go through as we as we do that, as we step into our lives. And uh, it's a really healthy thing to realize that we have a choice. We all can choose what we want to do. And uh, it can be what your dad did or what your mom did or what you have always been pushed to doing, but you can also choose to do something else. And um, so I've, I, I, learned, I learned to appreciate early on that we had a choice, that we all have a choice and we have a choice every day. So I chose to work as an actor for about 20 years and I loved it. And I started to, and it was people like Carolyn and Jane and, and other supporters uh, like Sue Frost at the Goodspeed Opera House, who was working there at the time, uh, who supported my decision to start exploring directing. And I felt finally, after 20 years of acting, that I had, first of all, some, some background and training uh, just from being around some wonderful directors that were huge influences on me as an actor, people like Tom O'Horgan and Joe Layton and Hal Prince that I got to work with as, act, as an actor, they became my directing teachers. Um, and, but I also felt finally 
um, perhaps a little late, that I had something to say as a person, that I knew what I stood for, that I knew what, and, and I realized that that's also important as a director. Even though you're interpreting, usually, other people's writing and work, you still have to know what you want to say right. with those words and how you can help them say it, how the, you can help uh, enhance or just even articulate what the writers uh, are are intending to communicate to the audience and and uh, and help refine that in the case of a new show that's constantly being rewritten. So I loved that aspect of directing and uh, John and Jen, which I brought up earlier, was the first show to do a full production of, and it's a small uh, cast show, two people, um, but. I, uh, every moment of just even conceiving the show visually and figuring out what it wanted to be, again, was just, I was so uh, invigorated every yeah. waking moment and basically every sleeping one too, because I would literally wake up as we all do when we're in a creative mode, you wake up and you have a fleeting image that was there in a dream or whatever, and you go, wait, hold on to that. And, and uh, I got to realize that as a director, uh, you know, as an actor, I had always been <laughs> yeah. very vocal about ideas I had, not pushy ever, but yeah. but uh, I used to love coming up with fun ideas. And as a director, you realize that's your job. You've got to come up with fun ideas and a way and a global view of the of the piece. And you know, it's step uh, outside it. Amazing what you said as far as when you get that aha moment and how you have to mm. capture that fleeting moment before it sort of goes away when Melissa Manchester was on, of course, a uh, fabulous uh, mm. Grammy winning singer and songwriter. She was talking about that. She was talking about, we talked about the things that influenced her and some of the songs that she either interpreted that other people wrote or that she participated in and she wrote. And she said there were many, many times and it still happens where she'll be inspired and she'll have to immediately go to the piano mm. and start working on it. Let her fingers, she's being guided, let her fingers start tickling the ivories and almost get a, a tape recorder and start recording it because each moment that goes by, it starts to fade and fade and fade and you don't get the full uh, Monty version of that creativity. <laughs> so you've got to preserve it. And she said, even for her, that's how it's worked. And I had a friend, um, he has since passed, but he would wake up uh, late at night. He loved when his house was quiet at night, when his mm. parents were asleep, his sister was asleep, and he would wake up at two in the morning and he'd go right to his typewriter and he'd get all of these incredible inspirations from maybe dreams or, or just thoughts. And he'd have to immediately go to the typewriter as soon as he woke up late at night when the house was silent, when there was no... Uh, chaos and responsibilities and start typing screenplays. He would have all these incredible creative moments at night when the house was still, but he'd have to get to that typewriter fast and just type away because as Melissa said, it starts to fade the further you get away from that initial aha moment. So very in line with what you, you said, and that's a I think that's a creative bent that happens when you're, you mean, you could be driving over a bridge and look at a site and see this vision and you always want to capture that. So you grab the camera quick or you, you try to save that moment and then see what you can develop from there. Right. Absolutely. I, I, I love the way she described that as it being so fleeting. And, you know, I guess that's what, you know, the, the strive uh, to, or, uh, you know, hope to become an artist someday is the ability to 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 sort of uh, harness those moments or enough of them. <laughs> you can string right. something together. I've heard uh, other composers describe that fleeting moment slightly different ways, and it's. I think everyone has a slightly unique, you know, relationship with their creativity and imagination and time of day and so on. But but um, I, I do believe it. It's it it is uh, the arts or being an artist or trying to be an artist is a combination of those moments and discipline and, you know, and, and being enough aware of life to be, uh, to, to, to create opportunities for those moments to happen as well. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a really fun way to go through life because you're, you're constantly on the lookout for those moments. And, uh, and I think, you know, Frankly, there's a lot of professions with that require that kind of creativity, of course, and I think there's a growing number of them. 
Um, so it's an interesting time. There's also been more, I think, still time for all of us in these months. Uh, and I, as you were sort of alluding to earlier, Jim, it's exciting to sort of, it'll be really interesting to see sort of what pops out of the ground after all this, after we all kind of open our windows and come right, out. Right, um, right, and, right. and aside from gratitude and appreciation for what all of the frontline people have been yeah. doing for all of us and, and making it possible for us to survive. This. In a way, I almost hope we don't go exactly back to the way we were before, because I think we were sort of not necessarily going in a great direction. I mean, mm. everybody was saying, where's, where's all the friendly people? Where's all the respect? <laughs> what happened to the civility? What happened to please? Thank you. You're welcome. You know, everybody was complaining about that, you know, the road rage and nobody pays attention and everybody's on their cell phone and stuck on social media and nobody liked it. And then boom, the world stopped. It's so we have this beautiful yeah. opportunity. If we didn't like some of the things that were happening before to come out of it, maybe making a few alterations and, and sort of closing the gap and bringing things uh, in a more unified, empathetic, caring way. That's what I hope. I hope so too. And it, it is kind of remarkable how, well, I guess it hasn't happened for a hundred years or so that it's not just our country or our community, but our world that is going through the exact same thing roughly at the same time. And I can only hope that that effect that you're describing is worldwide and and um, has a way of reminding us all, first of all, how precious and fleeting life is, but also how uh, responsible we are to ourselves. Exactly right. That's uh, and responsible we are to ourselves. I agree 100%. Uh, Jane also says, and talk about things that are coming up through all of this, the upcoming project HMSC involves your enormous experience in clowning. It's going to be wonderful. Excited to be working on it with you, June and Mike Reese. And Mike was on the show too, of course, Mr. Simpsons and so much yeah. more. Amazing, amazing person. He was a guest on the show. What a great uh, collaboration of people and that group. Tell us about that project. That sounds exciting. Gladly. It is exciting and we're thrilled about it. Um, Mike uh, is a genius comedy writer, as you know, from the shows you've just alluded to and many others. And one of his his uh, creations was a show called How Murray Saved Christmas. It was an NBC TV special that aired, I think, at least five times I in a row. I remember that, yes. Yeah, as I a remember really that. darling, sweet, somewhat irreverent, wonderfully yes. irreverent, as you can right. imagine him also writing, and uh, a piece. And uh, uh, I was very lucky that uh, June, um, uh, who's a friend of Mike's, uh, shared the piece with me recently, and I was just swept away by it. I just loved it. It was just uh, unabashed uh, humor, of course, and, and entertaining, um, but it, it was based on a, on a British panto, uh, the, the whole sort of uh, music hall uh, um, so under DNA was was sort of in the DNA of the piece as well, but but of course processed through Mike's wonderful wonderful mind and um, talents. So he's uh, adapted the piece now, which was an animation for the stage for mm -hmm. the live theater, and we did a Zoom reading uh, this summer of the piece just to sort of hear it out loud. It's got some wonderful wonderful comic music in the show, and wonderfully, the show is written for a cast of only five actors, five very funny, very yeah. talented, and very mercurial mm -hmm. actors who play a myriad of roles, uh, each of them. And we we had a, a wonderful reading with um, Bruce Valanche playing, playing uh, Santa Claus and Murray, and jo Jen Cody uh, playing the lead elf in the show, who sort mm -hmm. of, uh, we watched the show through her, uh, eyes and uh, and we had three other amazing actors who played all the other roles and um, it I cannot wait to to get on our feet with the show and we are we are now shopping around for the the right theater to to do a developmental production of the show maybe, as maybe as, when as we're able to maybe when that all comes together we can have a bunch of you come back all at the same time oh. and do another episode where several of you are on and we're talking about it as it gets closer that'd be cool. 
That would be really cool. They, I, we would love to do that, of course. That, that would be fantastic. Um, that's exciting. So that's And that's going to be joyful. People are going to be looking and wanting oh, yeah. things that take them away from you know everything that we've been dealing with uh, the last year or so. Um, the uh, Merlin in Ontario, Canada asks, she likes the artwork on the wall over your left soldier. So what we do sometimes is people always... Uh, wonder the room that the guest is in almost like and i'm trying to remember i got a edward r murrow had that show on cbs in the 50s 60s where he's leaning back in the chair with this cigarette and the big screen and now we're going to the home of jerry lewis and his kids and wife we're going to the home of desi arnaz and lucille ball i forget the name of that show that edward r murrow did on cbs where you know, we take you there or whatever, where you're going to the homes of stars and celebrities and performers. So right now we're in the home of <laughs> Gabriel and they want to know, that. and they want to know what's on the wall behind you. Melissa was in sort of like the entryway to her home and she was talking about all these pictures and then she went back to her childhood with her mom and father in the New York City uh, area and the, growing up in the Bronx, they had she was involved in artwork and taught Melissa, you know, about artwork. And now her home is surrounded with artwork. What is on your wall? Inquiring well, minds want to know. <laughs> I'm really, really happy you asked, actually, uh, because I, I alluded earlier to my wife, Trisha, who's a wonderful actress. She's been on Broadway five or six times. She does uh, straight theater, musical theater. She's a wonderful singer, um, very talented, and she works a lot in film and television as well, and in voiceover, the, the voiceover community, which, as you know, Jim, is uh, pretty small, um, and so she's counted herself very lucky to be in that uh, circle. Um, but she also has worked as an artist over the years, uh, very crafty, and one of her specialties is working with pressed flowers. And uh, while we were in California in that pioneer cabin, she was picking flowers and pressed them all, and she started doing more and more of her artwork. And that paint, that uh, picture is not a painting. Those are actual, it's a, it's a scanned copy of actual flowers that she pressed and arranged in artistic ways. And she's now started a company called Modern Pressed Flowers. I'll give a little plug. You can look her up online and see her shop. And uh, she's got all this new exciting stuff that's happening from her artwork that she started during the COVID period here. Um, she's now working with Oscar de la Renta on some fabrics and fashion. She's got a book deal in the works uh, about what she does with Modern Press Flowers. She has a gallery opening next this coming January to February. She'll be on the High Line. It's called High Nine. It's a gallery on the High Line that she's going to have her work uh, exhibited. Um, uh, she's designing a piano for Alicia Keys that she's doing wrapping a piano in flowers. Uh, she's now working on graphic uh, design so that she can scan these flowers and then enlarge them. So she's getting prints made and it's become quite a, quite a, a side business that she, she tells me she's going to be able to buy a car or a house for me someday. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking <laughs> forward to that day, but her, her work is quite wonderful and you should check her out. I was going to say, well. I, I would love to have her as a guest to talk about all these oh, terrific she, talents. She'd be, and she'd be, she'd be thrilled. I'm sure. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll let her know. Yeah. Oh, well. that's absolutely beautiful. And, and that's what they're saying. Uh, wow. Beautiful Juanita in uh, South Africa and uh, Bernadette. Best of luck with all her ventures, which I think is wonderful too. Um, it's really, really beautiful comments coming in here. So, so Merlin in uh, Canada is very happy. She knows what that the artwork is there uh, that is created by your <laughs> lovely wife, and uh, really, really nice. So, there's a lot of uh, creative creativity in your home. Yes, I'm very, very uh, lucky about that. She's she's been the the wonderful uh, influence artistically on our our children because they both. Uh, draw and do really unique things uh, with uh, with their artistic talents as well already, and uh, um, it's really been fun to see to see that take uh, take root in in them and their appreciation for the arts in general and for and for their own uh, talents as they develop. Do they have specific areas that they want to go into, uh, or they're still toying with some of the areas within the arts? 
Well, they're still toying. I mean, they're ten and thirteen. The, yeah. What yeah. they play, one plays guitar, one plays violin, but that takes uh, a little more nudging than I wish it did. Um, but the guitar, yeah, yeah. All of us, all of us, I think, start out if we play an instrument. Uh, it, it takes nudging for many of us uh, early on. Um, but I hope they stick with those because I think that they're they're wonderful instruments. Um, but they both draw beautifully and really well and unique uh, sort of styles. So so um, Tristan started selling his cards on the street uh, when he was uh, like four or five years old. Is uh, he designed cards and um, um, with uh, illustrations and stuff, and they're they're really quite wonderful, especially to to look back on. That's fantastic. That's mm -hmm. great, huh? That's amazing. How about you? Other than acting and directing, are there other artistic <laughs> uh, ventures that you have? Do you have a green thumb or, you know? <laughs> well, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time for other to, things. To do. I'm always embarrassed. I do love biking. I bicycle yeah, around yeah. New York. That's how I get around. And now uh, my kids are bicycling now too. Luckily, they're old enough where I'm not completely petrified at the thought of them bicycling in New York City. Um, so I do love that and, and uh, um, you know, st staying active as much as I can, of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have some wonderful photos here that I want to show that our uh, crack research staff of uh -oh. self, self, self and self <laughs> found here. Um, and these are some of the productions. And maybe you can, when you see them, you can take us through some of the productions uh, that you've been involved in. Of course, we have this great photo, period. That's, <laughs> what was that event? What was happening? Well, it, I can see the Amazing Grace logo uh, in the background. Yeah, so yeah. it looks like it was a uh, opening night of Amazing Grace is my guess. Mm, really, really nice. Well, here's some photos here that I think our audience are gonna love from some of the productions and you can take us through. So this was a, a show um, I've now worked in Prague in the Czech Republic uh, five times. The first show I did internationally was uh, as a director was a show called Carmen written by Frank Wildhorn. He was commissioned by the theater in Prague to do that show and it's now still running. It's in its 12th year. But the, this show is written by a Czech composer who wrote the book Music and Lyrics. He's a wonderful sort of Renaissance man and uh, these are all photos from that production of Holmes the Legend. It's a musical about Sherlock Holmes and Arthur Conan Doyle who created Sherlock Holmes and it's a really interesting show about creativity in a way because the same actor plays Sherlock Holmes and plays Arthur Conan Doyle who created the character um, and so uh, this is a famous actor on the right, uh, Wojta Dijk and uh, 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 his love interest on the left. And the show is a big, splashy uh, musical. A uh, wonderful choreographer, Karen Sieber, did the choreography. She was also from this country, um, but everyone else on the team was Czech. Um, and uh, I've had the great honor to work at this theater, uh, as I said, five times. And uh, this show has ended up being a big uh, success there where it's still playing. And it was it's a remarkable opportunity to work in on uh, this theater. It's a it's a, a wonderful 1100 seat uh, Victorian jewel box of a theater and uh, with a big stage um, mm. backstage. So uh, I've done uh, now, as I said, five different shows there. And this was the most recent uh, original Czech musical. Mm. And then here's the one you were talking about. Amazing Grace. Yes. And. Uh, this was uh, the wonderful uh, Aaron Mackey uh, and uh, playing the role of Mary. And this is uh, our wonderful uh, uh, Josh uh, playing uh, John Newton. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was quite a, quite a wonderful uh, um, stirring process to go through the, the development of this show that Carolyn was um, amazing uh, to, that she uh, was able to 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 bring this home, as it were. This the whole show takes place on the deck of a ship. The wonderful Eugene Lee, uh, with the with uh, his associate Eddie Pierce, who's a wonderful designer himself. The two of them designed the set, which is sort of the deck of a of a ship, um, and. Uh, 
the uh, the entire show sort of uh, took place in that environment, and uh, it was it was just a terrific experience uh, to work on this, and uh, um, I hope it has a further and further life uh, mm. as it should. Mm. Fantastic, and then there's this one too, Wild Party. Yes, this was a really exciting project uh, that uh, I worked on early in development at the uh, Eugene O'Neill Theater Center. We then uh, did the show at the Manhattan Theater Club. We did a workshop there. Um, and this is a photo from a shoot, a photo shoot that we did after the show played at uh, City Center uh, through Manhattan Theater Club. The show was a um, quite a wonderful opportunity and, and I think a great success for them. Um, you may know of one interesting history. This was in the year 2000 and uh, there was another show, uh, quite a few versions of, of, of uh, musicals or shows based on this source material, uh, which was a poem written in 1927 by Joseph Monacure March that fell into public domain in around 1994, 1995. And uh, uh, many people were starting to compare the 90s to the roaring 20s because of the coming millennium and there was just a synchronicity there so a lot of people around the world sort of grabbed that source material and started creating uh, work um, based on it um, there was it coincided with the release of of that poem it's a it's an epic long poem um, but Art Spiegelman the famous uh, cartoonist released a version of the poem with his illustrations that were all black and white and extremely evocative and wonderful, imaginative. And I think that's just stirred a lot of people's imagination. And one of them was Michael John Lacusa, who wrote a musical that was produced at the public theater called The Wild Party. And the other was Andrew Lippa, who wrote and, and created his show uh, called The Wild Party at Manhattan Theater Club. So it was a really exciting kind of battle of the the uh, the two wild parties. One of uh, the, the public theater one opened on Broadway uh, and uh, uh, eventually closed after a fairly short run. And after we were playing uh, off Broadway, um, we were contemplating seriously, we meaning our producers, uh, Kevin McCullum and Jeffrey Seller, uh, were contemplating a move for, for our show to Broadway as well. And so they um, created this uh, photo shoot that we did uh, in the middle of the day uh, in a, a, a really fun club down on the uh, Lower West Side. And uh, it was a, a really fantastic photo shoot. Um, and uh, so that's where those, those photos were from, but they, they were sort of recreating moments we had in the show as well. And there's some great photos of the, of the production uh, that exist as well. But it was a really special production and Andrew wrote a magnificent piece. And uh, it was uh, certainly my honor to get a chance to uh, help interpret it and, and create that, that, that piece and that moment in time uh, happened, uh, um, you know, as the century changed and it was, uh, it was a really exciting time. This was a show that uh, developed with Stephen Schwartz um, called Magic To Do. And uh, we combined magic with his music and uh, created a thin sort of membrane of a story, but it's basically a review of Stephen's music from his entire catalog, including his film work, Pocahontas, and some songs from other shows, as well as show songs from uh, Wicked and, and others. So. Uh, it was a really beautiful experience that we created with uh, the wonderful choreographer, Jennifer Paulson Lee, who I've collaborated with quite a bit. There's a Houdini section in the show. Um, and uh, this was uh, uh, one part of that section where um, uh, he was, there, there, there still exists today, as far as I know, seances once a year, Houdini died on Halloween. And so every year there's a seance somewhere in the world trying to bring his spirit back. He always said if he could, he would escape from even death. Um, and so this is, uh, this is portraying one of those uh, seances for a brief moment within a musical number in the, in the show. Here's another uh, moment from that show, Magic To Do, um, which uh, is Colors of the Wind. And uh, really beautiful uh, rendition of that. We had a terrific design, Broadway design team uh, and uh, stunning uh, 
effort put forth. Uh, and this show was created, believe it or not, for Princess Cruises, where mm. it was still playing on three vessels when COVID hit. Um, hopefully, the cruise business will come back for yeah. uh, for all of the reasons we want that to happen, yeah. <laughs> um, including uh, the shows and the performers that that get to to work on it. We used as a motif in this show uh, the painter Magritte, who I've always loved. Uh, he's uh, such a he used to call himself a thinker rather than a painter, and mm. uh, you can see the the his his art is very conceptual and. It, it seemed like a perfect uh, aesthetic choice for this um, for this show, and it and all our designers really um, centered around it beautifully. And uh, we're very proud of the, the 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 whole production. We did a cast album for the show, and and Stephen was very proud of it too. And we're we're actively trying as soon as uh, things come back to uh, to create the, uh, a land version of the show that can that can exist uh, uh, either on tour here or, or be, we've explored even some international productions for the show. So we hope we can uh, can find life for that. That's amazing. Oh dear, this is me <laughs> in my latest uh, uh, opportunity to play the role of Cyrano in Cyrano de Bergerac. And you alluded to this earlier, it's a, a chamber version of the show, I would call it, uh, with eight actors. I was one of them, and I helped uh, conceive this uh, this approach to it, along with uh, wonderful fight director Rick Sordelay, who I've worked with uh, many times over the years. Um, and uh, we had a terrific time uh, putting the show together, which was infused with, it was not a musical, but infused with um, some amazing music written by Alex Zavronsky, who was also our co-adapter on this project. And uh, uh, we actually got to develop some of this out at Rutgers University, where I was a guest artist and, and uh, did a, a bigger version of this uh, approach to the show. And then as we moved into the, the city, Rick and, and Alex especially were really helpful in, in giving me the courage to cut it down to even less and less actors. So we did it with eight people at uh, the theater at St. Clement's just a couple of years ago. And uh, it was a really, really rewarding experience. And and Rick and I have both been peddling the show and trying to find another opportunity to, to develop it further. But uh, I really loved this play, of course, and, and loved working on it, um, uh, not just because of uh, the role it played in my uh, finding my Roxanne, uh, if, if I can say that, uh, mm -hmm. and, and uh, bringing Trisha and I together, but but also just because uh, I find it one of the most uh, beautiful roles uh, written. And um, uh, I even played the role uh, in the production I mentioned that I did with, with Trisha that was at the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey in 1990. Eight, I guess, was the production because we got married in 1999, and I did that production without any prosthetics on my nose, <laughs> which, was, which was quite courageous on my part, I thought. Uh, and I don't know how good a choice it was artistically, but uh, Bonnie Monte, who's a wonderful artistic director there and is still is still there, uh, directed that production. I had a great time with with her and uh, and uh, embracing that choice, and it was uh, so it was so it was. It, I, and and the first, uh, when I brought up um, moving to New York after high school, the, the, the piece I auditioned with to get into the American Academy of Dramatic Arts was, of course, a monologue from Cyrano. So uh, it's come full circle. I've gotten to play the role uh, five times now. Mm, that is absolutely amazing. <laughs> Here's another great production. Summer of 42, this was the original production that was at the Variety Arts Theater, which is no more, sadly. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we were the first production in that theater. Um, and uh, beautifully uh, rendered um, by the design team. And we that show also started up at the Goodspeed Opera House, where it had a wonderful production as well. Um, so you can see we had to shrink everything down. When you come to New York, everything gets smaller. It yeah, gets smaller, right? <laughs> Which is right. ironic. But right. I kind of love that process too. Um, you know, the show John and Jen we mentioned earlier um, did that as well as we moved into the, and we came up with an entirely new design concept, but um, 
it worked uh, worked beautifully. And I think oftentimes when you ha are forced to uh, limit even more um, the physical production, the creativity uh, increases proportionally. And uh, it's really kind of interesting to watch that happen uh, as well th over the years with with project after project. Case in point. Oh, here's uh, from the New York Times. Yeah. Oh, oh, this is um, that's Eartha Kitt and yeah. John, John Kander at the at the piano, and this was a very special musical that uh, did have a production at the Westport County Playhouse, where so many things oh, have yeah. started, and where, where it was, uh, Thornton Wilder used to premiere many of his uh, works, and this is based on the Skin of Our Teeth, a musical that we called All About Us. Um, and I got to work uh, on with uh, with the amazing Eartha Kitt and uh, the amazing writing team, of course, of Candor and Ebb, which was needless to say, yeah. on firing and <laughs> educational. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was one of Fred's last efforts, um, one of his last shows that he worked on with John. And mm -hmm. this is a, it was such a, beautiful piece um and and a complicated play to base a musical on but but uh, we had an amazing uh, experience of course and i learned so much from from it mm. and the westport country playhouse in westport connecticut fabulous place i think originally started by was it uh, joanne woodward and paul uh, newman that's that was, right. That yeah. was their baby, yeah. Well, they they took it over at a certain certain point. Uh, it, it goes back a long way. The history is is beautiful, and you can feel it in the bones. Where the structure of the theater there is quite quite marvelous, and uh, yeah, um, they've done some had some wonderful things across their boards, as they say. Absolutely. Uh, we have more to show. However, some wonderful comments coming in here. Uh, we, I think you touched on this a little bit earlier, but Linda joining us a little bit late has that question about what do you like doing the best, the acting or the directing? If sure. Well, certainly it's been interesting because uh, I have had the opportunity since I made a living as a director to once in a while go back and act. The pictures you showed earlier of my doing Cyrano was the most recent time I've done that. Um, and uh, you know, I used to think once I started directing that I would never be able to be an actor again. Like I'd be too frustrated about, well, shouldn't I do this? Or wait, shouldn't I come in from this side? Because, you know, I'd be that I couldn't turn off the director in me. And what I, I found <laughs> was actually surprised me a little bit was that I love performing and not having to think as a director now when I get the chance to do that. So um, that was that was that was an eye opener. I didn't realize how much I I missed acting in a way. Um, and so I do love that opportunity to not be responsible for the entire sort of uh, creative uh, uh, process and so on. Um, but ultimately, uh, I've made the choice, like I said earlier, to to focus my efforts on directing, and I I do love that. Um, it 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 uh, so exciting and invigorating to be part of uh, creating a new a new story, and uh, um, you know it's especially rewarding, of course, to to work with such notable writers um, and 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 again help them find their voice and to and to and to work on on new pieces so i i, I love that uh, and and um as an actor of course it's pretty hard to work internationally uh, unless you're working in english and i now you know been able to develop um uh, a nice international career as a director but always working in the native language of wherever i am so um, I work through translators, but obviously I couldn't work as an actor in another language instantly because that would take um, knowing those languages much better than I than I do as a director. So uh, it's afforded me the chance to see see the world. And and you know uh, I've mentioned earlier how uh, tough it is on on my wife especially and kids to not be there all the time. But uh, conversely, they get a chance to see some pretty interesting places in the world as well. And so we, again, try to look at the positive of that. And uh, they've had the chance to see some pretty cool uh, places in the world. And, and those opportunities uh, keep growing as well. We welcome Karen Campbell-Green watching in Nova Scotia. Good evening, Loverties, Jim and Gabriel. 
Linda Odell in Florida, great photos. Merlin in Canada, great makeup. She's looking at the makeup. Mm -hmm. uh, great photos from Juanita, South Africa. Eartha Kitt from Bernadette. Uh, okay. Christine saying, Kendra and Ebb, how wonderful to work with the best. Merlin asks, uh, do you direct yourself if you're acting? Well, uh, if, if I'm acting, uh, that did happen with the Cyrano Project. I was the, the director, but again, um, I would only do that in rare, rare situations where I felt really comfortable um, with the, the acting part of it. Uh, it would not be my choice. I'd rather have at least a co-director who would be helping me. I've done it a few times where I've directed the show and been in it. Um, and uh, it's, it's tricky. It's, and it's tough on the other actors because either if I'm watching in the house and I've got somebody standing in for me, then those actors aren't actually working with the set person who's going to be out there in front of an audience with them. And right. uh, so it, it, it is, it's a, it puts us, it's a strain on, on the production. I would say I, I'm fulfilled doing both, but doing both at the same time is a challenge and I don't recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> you heard that from the director. <laughs> he doesn't, doesn't, he didn't say you couldn't try it. He just said, you he can't, doesn't, yeah, doesn't recommend it. <laughs> Here's some more. Oh, that's the wonderful Linda Edder in the first show I worked on with Frank Wildhorn, who I now work with quite a bit. I'm proud to say, and, um, we did this show, uh, Camille Claudel at the Goodspeed Opera House as well. And this starred, uh, Linda. Uh, as Camille, and uh, I was very proud of this production. Howell Binkley, the wonderful late Howell Binkley, did the lighting for this uh, production, and you can see in a few of these shots how masterful it was. And uh, we had a re that's uh, Rodin, the character of Rodin there, and um, we had some wonderful notions in this production where uh, we had the ensemble playing uh, other artists or fellow workmen in in uh, his atelier, um, but they would go back and forth from becoming the statues and sculptures that they themselves were working on to being the artists. And we had mm -hmm. uh, with the wonderful choreographer Mark Dendy, with whom I did the Wild Party, he choreographed this as well, and he and I came up with some wonderful, I think, uh, notions. This is the wonderful Walt Spangler, who I'm currently working with in in China right now who did the set for this uh, production. You can see it's quite beautiful. All that area that's right behind uh, Linda and, and uh, company is usually off stage right in, at the Chester Theater in, in the Norma Terrace Theater. But we opened up this wall and we, uh, we um, created uh, an artist atelier out of the space. Uh, it was beautiful work, the, 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 the uh, crew and, and designers and, and uh, shop did up there at Goodsby. They have simply one of the best uh, outfits in the entire country, as you can see as evidenced here. Um, yeah. It yeah. was really a beautiful looking production and uh, um, started, uh, I think, uh, what's been for me certainly a very rich, uh, very rich relationship with with uh, Frank Wildhorn. Uh, and this is the wonderful uh, Linda with, uh, oh my God, this is not good to blank on his name. <laughs> Somebody help me out here. Uh, Oh shoot! I'll, I'll think of it in one second. Uh, want to phone a friend? <laughs> <laughs> I do want to phone a friend. Can't throw these uh, photos with. Um, this is Matt Bogart with Linda. She played her brother, who in real life, uh, falsely well, uh, accused her of going crazy, and so she was put in an insane asylum. Uh, Camille was for the last forty years of her life, and never sculpted again. She herself was a, a an amazing artist. So it's quite an interesting story. She was Rodin's uh, lover for 10 years or mistress and, um, and then uh, was, was again prematurely or whatever the right word is falsely uh, sent to an asylum. But, uh, this is a beautiful. Uh, beautiful sets, lighting, costuming, yeah. and with all of these productions, I mean, they're really well, you're, thank you're you. surrounded by some really talented people on stage and, you know, behind the scenes and in front and above and below and every, everywhere. There's another one. Yeah. Now this is uh, also a Frank Wildhorn musical that had its world premiere in Seoul, Korea. Um, this is called Tears of Heaven. And, uh, 
it was uh, set in the Vietnam War and it was a love triangle with a Vietnamese singer, um, a Korean private, and an American colonel played by Brad Little. And the show was, was in Korean, but the colonel spoke English and any of the uh, characters who had to interact with him spoke spoke English, or broken English. And uh, this was a stunning production that uh, David Gallo did the set for. And uh, we had a, a Korean uh, lighting designer uh, who was just stunning. There were, uh, you can see here, this entire um, floor was a raked floor with um, LED lighting in 42 different tiles that we created different patterns on the floor. Um, the projections were, were stunning um, and uh, it was really beautiful, beautiful production. Um, yeah, this is uh, in uh, Northern Vietnam where the uh, enemy was plotting and uh yeah there's some some really beautiful images here this is the original production of memphis which i was uh honored to direct uh both at the north shore music theater uh, and that's chad kimball who ended up doing the show on broadway um and uh we uh we did the show at the north shore music theater and and california at the uh the at theater works out there as well so it's a really exciting uh, experience. Merlin asks, uh, do you like Shakespeare or would you ever consider working at Stratford Shakespeare Festival in Stratford, Ontario, Canada? I'd very much love to do that. And I've talked to them over the years here and there about projects and uh, I would love that opportunity. Yes, I love Shakespeare. I've directed a number of Shakespeare um, plays, uh, both at the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey, I described working at as an actor earlier and at uh, Connecticut Repertory Theater up in, up in Connecticut um, uh, and, and other places. I, I, I love uh, working on a Shakespeare play. I think, you know, I, I prefer to have a year of pre-production for a Shakespeare play, not for the physical production, just to wrap my head around it. But it uh, never fails to be not just uh, educational to do that, but life-changing to get inside any of his plays. Um, and so, uh, yes, I'd love to do more of that. Um, Jennifer absolutely. asks, did you ever see any theater ghosts? She's seen ghosts all her life and still do, especially at theaters. Well, I suppose uh, the answer would be, it depends on what you call a theater ghost. <laughs> I've certainly seen, uh, you know, theaters, uh, you know, full of spirit, let's put it that way. And at, at those moments um, of, uh, you know, sort of, this uh, cathartic kind of group experience to me i would almost call that a spiritual or or a ghostly <laughs> experience because uh and and it, and it's a testament to especially important to remember in these times i think the primal need for people to be in one space and share stories and yeah. i i it's what has always given me faith that theater will never die and that um that we will uh whether we're considered essential or not isn't important but that that we can continue to tell our stories learn from them grow from them and hopefully grow closer together through them is uh what i think we all have to hope uh, certainly any of us who are in the arts have to hope um and and but i've seen it happen i've seen audiences when when you know amazing grace uh played never failed to sort of bring that uh amazing uh, experience into the room uh and many other shows i've been fortunate enough to, to to work on it and many shows i had nothing to do with that where i felt that that kind of uh, bond um yeah. from being in the room together and hearing the same story and even yeah. if you gets other things or different things out of that story. Yeah. The fact that you shared it together and you saw live theater, live moment, people living in front of you telling a story is uh, is really is really stirring to me and gives me purpose. Um, this is uh, again other other moments in Memphis. Um, it's quite a wonderful project. Now, this is a production that I did at Connecticut Repertory Theater of Hair, and uh, very proud of this production. We had a really interesting concept 
that I thought worked really well for the show and would love the chance to do again and realize again. Uh, we started um, with, uh, thank you, Milo O'Shea was, uh, thank you, Bart, <laughs> I appreciate that. That was the wonderful Milo O'Shea playing uh, Camille's father. Uh, and uh, yes, Michael Nouri was playing Rodin in that production. So Bart, please uh, join me on any any interview I'm lucky enough to do with Jim or anyone else <laughs> so you can, you can keep my uh, name straight. Um, so the concept for hair that we did was really I thought beautiful uh, idea. We started with the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., which you may know has the uh, names of the, mm -hmm. all of the Americans killed in Vietnam. I think it's yeah. uh, uh, quite a few thousand, 19, yeah. 28,000. I'm going to forget that number too. Uh, but um, it's, a, it's a moving monument to, to visit, which I've done. And we, uh, the whole stage was, was covered with that monument. And we had an old man come down the aisle and go up and look for uh, the name on the monument. And uh, as he touches the name, the monument, uh, you can see through the monument to his tribe. And he, it turns out, is, of course, uh, the lead in the show. And they sort of bring him back in time through the, uh, through the entire uh, experience of burgers. And uh, um, so it was a really exciting production to work on up up there in the Connecticut. Mm, really fantastic, huh? Yeah. 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 We uh, also really in, in this production explored uh, lighting techniques um, uh, that we developed uh, at uh, at the uh, University of Connecticut there. Oh, yeah. Were, UConn were, Stores, Connecticut. Yes, right? that's right. This is where this production took place. And we used techniques that were popular in the 60s. So we didn't, we, we of course, we use some modern uh, moving lights here and there, of course, as you can sure. see, but, but uh, we, we relied very heavily on lighting techniques uh, using overhead projectors and oil and water and some really cool things that they were doing at Fillmore East, Fillmore West, and these, these clubs uh, where, where the hippies hung out. We, of course, had puppets and masks uh, involved in, uh, in the production as well all developed there. University of Connecticut has one of the best puppetry programs in the world. They are the only college in the United States that offers a doctorate, in fact, in puppetry. Um, so we were um, really, really uh, lucky to, to be able to develop that uh, mm, um, there. Yeah, and so we, we use puppetry as well as uh, uh, wonderful lighting techniques. Oh, this was a concert just of last year of the Scarlet Pimpernel at uh, Lincoln Center with a star-studded cast and of, of over, I think, 250 people, <laughs> including yeah. the uh, 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 choir of, uh, of 200 and an orchestra and a Broadway cast of 20. Um, so that was quite a one-night event. Um, and here they're singing Into the Fire. I love this musical by uh, Frank Wildhorn and Nan Knighton. And, uh, um, I've had the great fortune to direct it in Japan um, twice and uh, uh, with, with Frank's involvement and adding new songs and so on. We sort of, for this version of the show, that's Laura Osnes in the center, we added some of the, the songs that we had added in Japan for it. So this was an all new version. This is uh, Alice Tully Hall where the show played and uh, was really an exciting action-packed day <laughs> bring this show yeah, about I mean, look uh, we it. had yeah. only a few packed days house. Of yeah a packed house it was a really uh exciting uh exciting uh event and uh fun 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 to work on hmm. yeah and the lighting and everything there too as well yeah, I mean, wonderful jason kantrowitz who i was uh, i'm very lucky to call a friend and frequent collaborator, um, Jason and I did Billy Elliot, the first Billy Elliot production in Mexico together uh, just three or four years ago and very proud of what we created there. And then we got to uh, work again on the same uh, show, Billy Elliot, up at the Goodspeed Opera House just last year. And uh, we won quite a few Connecticut awards for that production, which we're really proud of too. And Jason did a beautiful job with this concert, as you can see. Um, in this, uh, you know, one day affair, 
come in at uh, eight in the morning and at <laughs> eight at night you're on. Yeah. That's uh, so, so a lot of, a lot of organization goes into, uh, into uh, these things. Uh, these are produced, these concerts have been produced beautifully by Manhattan concert productions, who I was really lucky to work with and uh, I'm working with now. They have a, now a whole teaching program called forward motion, which is uh, music based or concentrated, but uh uh, I'll be teaching an online directing course there, too, as starting fairly soon. So that's exciting. The teaching part of it, you must really like that, huh? I mean, I love when I get a chance to, I think we're all teachers in our own ways, and then sometimes we pursue that a little more deeply. You really like paying it forward and teaching and mentoring and and sort of consulting, coaching others, especially those who are coming up the ranks, right? I absolutely do, of course. I think it's vital to teach because I think we we all learn, obviously, as we teach as well. And uh, um, I've really enjoyed university experiences I've had. Um, and and uh, it's really uh, reassuring and reaffirming to me to see eager students, especially as they usually are in the arts, because they don't have to be there. If, right. if, they, if they really would want to, you know, make some money in their life, they're usually studying law or something else. So <laughs> if, hopefully if they're in a performing arts program, they really want to be there. So I guess I have that going for, we have that going for us, uh, anybody who's teaching in the arts. But still, uh, it's not unusual to hear teachers complain about apathy and um, uh, sort of, uh, dullness in in the student body and i've never experienced that i've been so lucky to work at the university of connecticut nyu uh university of oklahoma many other universities around the country um not only uh to do shows like hair and 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 uh find new life in shows that have already been done but universities are now becoming uh really fantastic fertile tryout grounds for new material um, as we all know, the days of, of financing a show to have an out-of-town run, uh, which adds usually a million to two million dollars to your budget, um, are all but over because of, of, of affordability and, and so on. Um, so now that's, that development is now falling on regional theaters um, and uh, courageous producers and, and developmental productions uh, or workshops. and. Um, so universities has been one place that uh, that is taking up some of that slack. I think uh, obviously it affects their budgets too to create new music or orchestrations. But the universities that are finding their way around those obstacles, I think, are really benefiting it from it. And so are the students. Most importantly, that's been the case at NYU, where I've worked for the last two years, uh, doing one show a year, and we got to revisit a show called Rags, which was my first Broadway show as an actor. Um, and uh, that show's been been uh, a beautiful part of my life now from those days as well as this uh, latest revival I got to work on. Um, and uh, uh, I know that the show deserves a, even a, a new life which they're which they're pursuing um, and I hope uh, receive. Um, and I got to work on a show, uh, another show of Frank Wildhorns at NYU recently. Uh, called Wonderland, which was not a success on Broadway, uh, monetarily at least, but is actually a wonderful piece. And uh, uh, we got permission from Frank and the others to um, work on the, the script of the show. And uh, Jennifer Paulson Lee, the choreographer I mentioned earlier that I collaborate with quite a bit, and I uh, had permission to experiment with some of the book in the show. And we are now uh, official book writers on the show, and we are going are pursuing other uh, full professional productions of the show with our names on it now, as well as uh, directing and choreographing it. So we're hoping to develop the show in Utah and some other uh, theaters we're pursuing in uh, Europe as well. So we're really excited about that opportunity. So once again, the university, uh, the, the kids benefit from I say kids, the young actors benefit from, <laughs> from getting to, uh, you know, find a, find a character and, and work on new material and, and have people come into the rehearsal process and they, they realize that, oh, this can change and, and, uh, they, real, and, and they feel a sense of ownership and um, organic satisfaction about being part of that change. 
Um, whereas if you're just doing a show that's been done a hundred times, yeah. you, don't, you don't necessarily get that experience. Of course, you have to breathe new uh, and vibrant life into it no matter what. But, uh, but a show that, that is still being worked on is, uh, brings a whole nother dimension to, to the experience for both the, the cast and the audience. Any dabbling in or desire to dabble in television and film? Absolutely. I've always loved film. And when I was in high school, I was as distracted by working on short films back in the day uh, as I was uh, about performing in front of the camera or in uh, on stage. Um, and I still am fascinated by it and love it. And, and my wife uh, also over the last couple of years and I have been working on a um, web series called Mommy Blogger. We've done about 25 or 30 episodes. They're like six or seven minutes long each and that show has been optioned um, and uh, she's been pitching it. Uh, she's been the head writer and the star of the show and I've directed many of the uh, episodes and I've just loved it. It's been really, really fun. It's what great, is it about? It's a, it's a, the concept is a uh, mommy blogger. Um, this is, this, these are real um, <laughs> bloggers that are mothers and they actually make uh, some serious money um, by uh, bringing on sponsors. And uh, if they have enough followers to warrant it, people will pay them to do posts about this diaper or that, or this ice cream cone or that, or this uh, beautiful new blouse or that. And uh, they travel the world usually, and many of them make a lot of money. Trisha became exposed to these people first because she was a loyal follower of many of them. and But she then began to sort of see with some of them, uh, a, a kind of artificiality and a kind of a manicured or curated life that they were mm. putting in front of their social media. And I think we all do this to some extent now. Filtered photos. That's and, right. Yeah. That's sure. <laughs> Photoshop. And yeah. yeah. And it's like, here's me. I just happened to turn the corner. And, but of course, you know, meanwhile, her husband is painstakingly photographing her for <laughs> 200 hours. photo. I think I once heard actually that the <laughs> average person, uh, takes 250 photos sometimes before they even select one to put on Instagram. I, I don't <laughs> doubt that a bit. So this character, <laughs> Addie, is, a, is a, a, a follower addict, and she, she wants to be one of the top, top rung mommy bloggers, but she can't understand why she only has 17 followers. <laughs> and uh, her character has four children, and uh, you never see the kids at all because it's all about her, of course. So she's yeah. an egomaniac. It's a really funny show. Written Sounds by funny, yeah. Eric Pfeffinger, a wonderful writer who I've been working with on other projects as well. And uh, um, it's uh, it's a really funny show. You can catch, check those episodes out if you go to Mommy Blogger, uh, I think dot com, um, and uh, you can see those episodes there. They're really fun. And and again, we hope to get a, a bite or two from from somebody to to take on the the show it's a really fun idea for us it's um, so topical too and so yeah, you know, apropos is. i uh it, it was a funny uh cartoon that was in uh the newspaper that i saw a couple of years back and it was talking about social media but it was specifically uh pointed towards facebook and it was really cool it shows the the cartoonist drew um what looked like a wake and you have this couple that's standing in front of the casket and you have these rows of chairs and then like one guy in the very back, the last seat of the, all these chairs. And the wife is looking at the husband standing in front of the casket. And she says to him in this cartoon uh, with all these rows of chairs, which happen to be empty chairs, except for again, that one poor soul in the back, Gee, I would have expected a bigger turnout considering he had 2,000 Facebook friends. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. There you have it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so well, that's, that's, that's probably a preview of the character Addie's uh, funeral, I'm sure, too. Sort of like, where are all her followers? Where are the actual friends who, you know, mm. there's various definitions these days of friendship and friend. It's yeah. taken on a whole new role. So uh, that sounds really cool and like a lot of fun and quite, a, quite exciting. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you haven't done that you 
I still really, I mean, of all the brilliant things and wonderful productions and great things you have been involved in and are still involved in and are creating, um, anything that uh, you still want to do and things uh, you want to tackle? I, I, I do want to uh, direct a movie um, and get to that point at, at some point. Uh, you know, it's, I, I love the theater and, and so it's, it's, it's not that I'm tiring of that in any yeah. way. Yeah, but uh, I love the medium of film. I always have, and I, I would love to do more uh, film work uh, for sure. And and I don't consider it too late to do that either. Um, it's just a matter no. of devoting time to it and finding the right uh, way to uh, to to do it. I the 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 work I have done uh, here and there in film and television, I've just so so enjoyed. It's a very different medium. It's more of a director's medium, I'd say, yeah. than than theater, which I would consider as an actor's medium. They're on the they're on the front line uh, of of the information. Um, but uh, so so maybe for that reason, and but I'm fascinated by it, and uh, um, so that I put that on the list. Yes. What continues to bring you uh, the greatest inspirations and, and joys in your life to to continue to create and develop and uh, have an opportunity to you know just expand upon your experience and your expertise. So obviously, you're. And I think most of the people I've chatted with, and I know certainly I am, and I'm, I am uh, inspired by being an observer of life, of all, every nuance, every light, every sunset, mm -hmm. every sound, every interaction, every facial expression. I see it and I absorb it. And it gives me uh, a spark of inspiration and creativity to say and do and create. So I'm observing the world around me and I'm sure you're, um, senses are always heightened and you're always listening and paying attention and absorbing, which comes out sort of like a conduit, a facilitator of these things that come through you and come out as beautiful creativity. Mm. Well, what a great question. And, and I'd say off the top of my head, you know, the things that continue to inspire me, first of all, are my children. I mean, having, being a parent for those who are parents, they know it's, there is no very hard to come up with an experience that that parallels that. So watching them uh, come into the world and uh, to see them uh, through the years that I've been able to enjoy my two uh, sons is really eye-opening every day. Um, and it truly is. I mean, I heard people say that before I had kids, and I would kind of like, yeah, yeah. Um, but but to actually experience that is 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 literally mind blowing and and um, mind, uh, you know, invigorating every day. Um, and I'd also say nature itself is, you know, uh, I know uh, it's a little general, but, but you know, whether I, I opened a pomegranate that uh, Trisha brought back from her the farm last week when she was coming back from California, and you just can't believe uh, some of the things we see in nature. And, and it's why, again, I think it's uh, obviously crucial that we hang on to whatever we can from nature these days, and 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 uh, find ways to celebrate it in a in a healthy way uh, together, um, because nature itself is a marvel. And uh, one of the reasons I love working on uh, the Shakespeare play uh, "Love's Labor's Lost" it deals with that that uh, r very interesting theme of you know man's attempt to harness nature will always fail. And uh, even to put nature into words will fail. You will never, ever, uh, you know, top nature in terms of beauty and marvel and poetry and whatever else you want to attribute to it. So I, I would say that continually ins inspires me. And the sunsets we got to see from the hills of California, uh, while the world, it seemed, was sort of turning inside out, were was was inspiring and uh, and I'm still inspired though today riding a bicycle through Central Park as well and uh, and seeing fellow human beings doing the same thing and and uh, getting through this in their own way and yeah. uh, I find that inspiring and that's one of the reasons I love love the theater is that exchange of those of those feelings between a, a, a cast and creative team and an audience mm, absolutely beautifully said my friend and this has been really extraordinary. Uh, we've actually been chatting for almost two hours. I can't believe it. That's I what everybody it was, says. Feels like fifteen minutes. You're you're wonderfully uh, open, and I, I love your your 
love, levit, your levity and levity and, <laughs> and your, and your, and your um, Levites all, everywhere. Um, clearly they've uh, uh, come back to uh, listen to you for a good reason and uh, really enjoyed chatting with you. Oh, it's my pleasure. And uh, you're welcome back anytime. And I hope uh, this experience in the show uh, met any expectations you had and you enjoyed your time with me as I certainly and clearly have with you, Gabriel. Same here, Jim. Congratulations to all your successes and the wonderful work that you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Best of the holidays. Thanksgiving. Keep me posted on all these cool productions. Uh, yes, your wife is welcome to come uh, on at some point and uh, when she can come up from air for air <laughs> for all these projects. Oh, pass and, that along uh, and I'm so sure she'll take you up on it. And it was really a joy getting to, uh, you know, have you share a little bit more about your passions all the way from Vermont to the mm -hmm. big city. And uh, we wish you nothing but continued good health and success and again, thanks for spending all this time. I know a lot of people say that, you know, wow, oh my God, I thought we just chatted for an hour and here it is an hour and 51 minutes. And it doesn't, never feels like that, right? No, it doesn't, Jim. Thank Good you. And, and thank you to uh, all your listeners as well. All those loveities, right? Yes. They're going to say a quick goodbye, I'm sure. I know they like to do that. So uh -huh. truly appreciate your time and enjoyed your listening to your stories. Great photos. Happy Thanksgiving. Stay safe and stay well. From Bernadette, Juanita, where it's really late into the late night in <laughs> South Africa. Great conversation. Thank you for your time and sharing your story, Gabriel. Keep well. Maureen, what a nice evening. Thank you, gentlemen. It is our pleasure. June, happy Thanksgiving, all our dear friend June. Hope to gather and break bread with maybe all of us. We can do that, uh, mm -hmm. Gabriel. That would be nice when we can get uh, together. Mary Bishop says, Thank you, Gabriel. Take care. Jill Jason says, Great show, Jim and Gabe. Jen is Zen. Jen <laughs> always likes to ask, and I'll ask it for her. Um, are you an ocean? She asked all the guests, are you an ocean person or a mountain person? Now, you, he did grow up in Vermont. He's a little closer to the ocean now, but what uh, calls uh, your heart, the mountains or the ocean? She's a mount, She's in Allentown, Pennsylvania, so the mountain. Uh, and I grew uh, up uh, along the coast, you know, uh, uh, here. So the, the ocean speaks to me for my zen. I, I love both, of course, but I, uh, I I gravitate to water. I really love water. Uh, there's something about it that uh, uh, soothes me, soothes me, and uh, yeah. that may be uh, you know <laughs> that may be biological or whatever. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, I'll, I'll take it e either way. I really really love the water. That's right, exactly, and me too. Uh, the rhythm, the tide, the the flow of it. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm always uh, sailing, swimming, uh, kiteboarding, boogie boarding, surfing it. I, the ocean just really calls me. This has been an amazing evening. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, Anne. Linda Ordell in Florida. Gabriel, I hope you and your family have a uh, happy Thanksgiving. Kathleen says, thanks, Gabriel. Stay safe. Marsha Murphy Watson, thank you, Gabriel. And uh, Merlin says, in Canada says, truly a great show and guest tonight. Thank you very much, Gabe and Jim. Um, and Sherry says, uh, Jim said that you had an amazing career so far, Gabriel, but when we can see so many photos and then you tell us something about each one, it's been a wonderful evening spent with you. Thank you. That's very beautiful to say Thank that. You, I'm so happy. Yeah, really, really nice. And a um, couple more coming in here. Uh, let's see. Marsha says, Jim, thank you for bringing Gabriel to us. Our pleasure. Cherry says, please come back again soon, Gabriel. You're definitely a lovety now. <laughs> so told you, you're a lovety. <laughs> and a uh, very happy birthday. To, Aww. Yeah, to your son. Thank you. I'll pass that along. Happy birthday to your sons. <laughs> and uh, Christine says, thanks, Gabriel, for sharing so much detail in your backstories to go with all your fantastic photos. It was great learning more about your career. Stay safe. Love it. And uh, happy Thanksgiving, Mr. Loverty, to you and your family. Happy Thanksgiving to all the loveities. And uh, Bart says, he wants you to do one more hour <laughs> game. Come on. <laughs> he, then he'd have to put another pot of coffee on. <laughs> and it, and right now he's, he's, his left leg went numb. <laughs> I have a piece of birthday cake waiting for me. Sorry, Bart. No, that's right. That's right. 
Gabe will be celebrating our son's birthday this Thursday as oh, well. Oh, that's yes. great. Happy birthday. Uh, Jacob or Jonathan, which which son, June? Um, and your sons as well. So happy birthday to everybody's birthdays this week and happy Thanksgiving to everybody. And Jennifer uh, in Allentown says, thanks, Jim and Gabe. Love you both. Jen is Zen. <laughs> my, my friend, this was an amazing evening. Thank you for all of the time and all of the uh, passion and enthusiasm that you've expressed tonight and loved it. And you're welcome back and spread the word about the show. I'd love that. And uh, you're, you're welcome back. Again, the door is always open and you take care. Thank you. You too, Jim. And thanks for having me. Real pleasure. Oh, absolutely. Have a good night. We'll see you again soon. You too. Bye now. All right. Bye-bye. And that's our very special guest, Gabriel Barry. I hope you enjoyed it. And a lot of great comments still coming in here. Thank you very much. And uh, also June says it's Jonathan. John was your little turkey. <laughs> so how, how, very apropos for this week, uh, June. Thanks for all these great comments and uh, all this lovity that's coming through. You guys are always on fire uh, with all the great comments. If you'd like to see this episode again or any of the episodes of the Gym Master Show live, well, there's somewhere you can go to visit and see them all right on our YouTube channel. If you joined us late, we had a brilliant conversation and lots of great photos and levity. I missed an episode and want to watch it again right there on our uh, YouTube channel. And love it if you subscribe to the channel too, as we build that channel right there at Jim Masters TV. That would be fantastic. We thank our very special guest, Gabriel Barry. He was absolutely amazing. And again, talking about some of those extraordinary productions that um, he's been involved in, whether it's through acting or directing, brilliant work. Uh, we thank him for coming on. He gave a good amount of his time and, uh, he really opened up at a, about his life. And te people tend to do that on this show. And I really, really love that. We, we have a lot of fun and levity, but sometimes we go deep. And I think that's fantastic. And you guys get a kick out of it too. And I think that's wonderful. Tomorrow, we've got an amazing guest too, Cindy Sinsone Braff. She's not only a choreographer, dancer, author, actress, theatrical uh, person, but she's also a psychic medium. She's from New York. And she's going to be here tomorrow. Uh, she wears many hats in the creative world. And she's all excited. She joins us tomorrow, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, live on our YouTube channel and also on Facebook. Want to let you know, one week from tonight, talk about the acting world. You recognize the face on the left first? That is Allison Argrim. Allison played Nellie Olson in Little House on the Prairie. And she's going to be here one week from tonight, November 30th. We're so excited. So join us. We're going to go down memory lane with Nellie Olson from Little House of the Prairie. And she's, of course, done so much more. Keith Harkin, the brilliant singer and songwriter originally from Celtic Thunder, is going to be here on December 12th as well. And lots more. We also say, of course, don't forget to smile. And don't forget to share the lovity. And don't forget to find your Zen place. Uh, Gabriel said his is the ocean. Mine is the ocean as well. I think because of the access, you know, growing up uh, here on the East Coast and the Northeast and always being by the water, in the water, near the water, I have a great respect for the water. So uh, the Zen places are my loving family and friends, uh, the ocean, cycling, tennis, music, creating, and of course, my uh, career in, in television and radio and stage uh, all these years. I love as well, creating and producing, hosting, uh, all the different things I get a chance to do. Um, blessed, uh, have been with it for a long time, studied it in school and been at it ever since and really, really love it. So find your Zen as well, whatever that may be and share it with the world. Kathleen Walker says, thanks, Jim. Have a great night. You too. Love all the emojis as well. Good night, all. Bart says, love the show, Jim. I'm a lovety bringing some past, oh, binging on some past episodes. Fantastic, Bart. That's absolutely fantastic. And you be well too. And good night, beautiful people. Cassandra, we'll see you too. You're here as a viewer and a lovety as well, but we'll see you soon in just a couple of weeks uh, when we welcome you back on our show for a great performance and so much more. Absolutely loved spending this evening with you, Jim, as well as the loveties. Another wonderful show. Thank you. 
It is my pleasure, my pleasure. Well, I love hearing that feedback. Absolutely do. And uh, you can't wait. Yay. Neither can we. We're going to have a good time like we did the first time. Lady Bane. Uh, thank you, Jim, for another great show. Good night, everyone, and stay safe. You as well. I appreciate that. And uh, thank you, Jim, for a wonderful evening. So nice to be able to watch live tonight. Good night, all. Absolutely. And uh, John was born on Thanksgiving Eve. Uh, you didn't make it to the Macy's Parade that year. I would imagine not. <laughs> and uh, Barry and Barry. Yeah, Gabriel Barry and uh, Jennifer Barry in Jim's house. Zen. I know it doesn't get any better than that, right? We've created one fabulous uh, lovety community here with so many different topics, themes, guests, and so much more. we got a lot coming up. We're so excited about. Uh, good night, Jim and all. You as well, Marilyn. Thanks for joining us there in Wichita, Kansas. Linda O'Dell, always phenom when you are here. Uh, good night, Mr. Levity. Good night, Levities. Good night to you as well. Um, and uh, you love Allison. She's a nice, fun lady. Love her. Oh, Allison. Allison Frazier. Allison England. Both of them were fantastic. Um, absolutely. Bernadette says, thank you, Jim. Everyone, please continue to stay safe and stay well. More coming up here. Mary Bishop says, uh, good night, everyone. Take care. You too. Thanks for all of these great comments. And as you know, I'm a very interactive person with the viewers. I love celebrating the viewers and all of you because uh, I might create and host the show, but I think you guys are also the stars as much as I am and the guests are as well. We're all in this together. As long as you're there, I'll continue to be here. Thanks for this Monday show, Jim. This Brazilian lovity wishes all of you a good night. I love that. Brazilian lovity. Hey, like, that's cool. Thanks uh, for those great comments. Carla and beautiful Brazil with that fabulous happy smile in her profile photo. Uh, you be well too, Carla. Love, light, and peace to you, Jim, and all the loveties out there. Absolutely. To say the same to you, Maureen. Love having you with us as a love day every night. One of your grandsons was born on November 25th. Happy birthday to your grandson as well. Good night, Jim. Thank you for another great show. Jill Jason, thank you very much as well. Good night, loveties. Sleep well and be safe. You too. Uh, love all of you guys. You're the best. I say it all the time. Uh, you think we have an issue with saying goodbye? Yeah, loveities do, loveities do. And uh, that's probably a good thing. <laughs> Takes a while, but you know, <laughs> you can go out and make a sandwich and come back and we'll still be saying our goodbyes. Or, or as I say, our see you laters. That's so sweet, Jim. Thank you very much. Irish goodbyes are, are always long. They, they certainly are, aren't they? Another great show, another great guest. Uh, and tomorrow, again, more of the very same coming up. And uh, yes, all your friends are here. I know you want to see the gang. And uh, this weekend, we'll have Lin Lin, the panda, with us. George is here. George loved it. He says hello. There he is, nice and close. There's George Burns. He, he sits by the sidelines with his uh, cigar. See the cigar? He's there and he watches and he listens. And then we chat about it. We do like a post-show summary uh, with all the uh, cast of characters afterwards. So he had a good time. And uh, yep, Jeannie, Jeannie's here. And she had a good time. Jeannie says good night to all of you. <laughs> She's in there. Bring her nice and close. There she is. You see her blinking at you. So Jeannie had a good time. And I tell you, I, I, with all this production value, I really need more arms. I need to be an octopus. <laughs> and uh, there we go. There's Jimmy. Jimmy says goodnight to all of you. Happy with his blue feet, his porcelain blue feet. Kind of cool, huh? Does that put a smile on your face? He's a happy clown. He's a happy clown. I always say that for those who might be oh, fearful of clowns. He's a friendly clown. Childhood toy. Gilligan is here saying goodnight as well with love from Bob Denver and Dream of Denver. He had a great time, right? Yeah, he had, a great, <laughs> he had a great time as well. And uh, let's see, who else? Oh, yeah, Silver is here, and Silver had a great time. Silver the Lab that we got on a TV shoot in Europe. Silver had a good time. Silver, you know, remains right here, making sure that everything is, you know, under control. And don't forget, as we always say, relax, breathe, breathe from the diaphragm, take care of one another, love one another, 
And uh, if you're not here with us uh, the rest of the next couple of days and you're leaving or what have you, have a beautiful and blessed Thanksgiving. We'll be here tomorrow night, uh, same bat channel. Relax, love one another and love yourself and breathe from the diaphragm. Remember to breathe and take time for yourself and find your Zen place and fill it with levity, as we say here on the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show Series. A couple more comments coming in, and then we will dismiss class, and you'll be able to continue the rest of your day. You're released. <laughs> you all got A pluses on your tests. Uh, Llewellyn says, good night, Jim. Another great evening. Thank you very much, Llewellyn. Love having you here as one of our regular levities. You joined recently, and that's uh, it's beautiful out there in the Palm Springs, California area. Hope to be out there soon. We have cousins out that way. Uh, Lovities, love you too, Miss Lovely. Thank you, Linda. Right back at you. And Christine, thanks for all your hard work put into each show. Good night, Jim and Lovities and cast of characters. See you tomorrow. Thank you very much, Christine. We say that. And cheers, H2O. Cheers to all of you, Lovities, viewers, friends, and everybody watching. Uh, another great night, another great time. And uh, we loved it. And I'm glad you guys did too. And this show continues to grow by leaps and bounds. People are discovering it. They're enjoying it. And I really appreciate that. Continue to spread the word. Tell everybody about our show. Um, and again, if you have uh, ideas, we've booked seven more guests. Uh, some are, we're going to be, <laughs> I got my work cut out for me, but there's some weekends in December where we're going to be doing two shows a day because of the guests um, wanting to hop on so quickly. So we're going to do that and accommodate. Um, and I love it too anyway. So, and they're going to be Christmas themed shows. So it's going to be an amazing month of December and some really, really an amazing scope of guests from all backgrounds are going to be here. And it's going to, the holidays are going to be great on the gym master show live. And um, we'll be kicking that off soon. So if you do have a suggestion for guests, even though, uh, and we're still getting back to all the people that, uh, you know, have been suggested. We try to, you know, there's a formatic to it, uh, a formal way that we like to invite our guests. Um, so there's a list we check off. Okay. This one, we reached out to that one. We reached out of all the people that want to come on our show. There's many people that are asking to come on the show. There's many people who've been on the show and then they told a friend and now that friend's coming on the show. Uh, even after Melissa Manchester last night, two more performers are probably going to be coming on the show. Um, really cool jazz performers as a result who are friends of hers. And it's just absolutely incredible. But there's our uh, email address for the show, TV at gmail.com. If you have guest inquiries, we will do our best to go through those. And, um, you know, all of us will review everything and then we'll try to get back to uh, we'll try to reach out to the guests as quickly as we can. We do have a lot of inquiries. We have a lot of people who want to come on or who want to come back on. Uh, some of the guests are coming back. Uh, Lady Bane's coming back for a Christmas episode. Um, it's really cool. But there, if you have guest ideas, they don't have to be musical. They don't have to be in acting. They don't have to be any of that. They can be anything. Uh, just as long as they're friendly, cool people. Um, Jill says, everybody loves to be interviewed by you, XOXO. Thank you very much, Jill. I appreciate that. I should interview myself in the mirror. <laughs> Actually, we all talk to ourselves once in a while, don't we? Always love to share and spread the word, Bernadette. Yes, you do. Llewellyn talked you up. Uh, Keith Harkin's stage at show last night. Oh, perfect. He's coming on December 12th at 3 p.m. Eastern, which is cool. We're also talking to his sister as well. Her sister's in Australia. And she also wants to come on the show too, which is really exciting. Also a brilliant performer. The word got out about your lovely show, LOL. Beautiful. That's wonderful. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you, Llewellyn. We've grown as a community. We certainly have, and we're continuing to. And I think that's awesome because everybody, I believe, brings something new and fresh to the table, right? Every single viewer, uh, guest, and the different things that I do. I really think that we all... Um, brings fresh things to the table. So I love having those who've been here since day one and those who've joined along the way and new faces joining us. I think that's fantastic. As long as everybody's friendly and respectful and civil and 
happy and you know having a good time that's what it's all about that's uh, that's what we like to have on the show so with that stay safe good night again from kathleen <laughs> kathleen likes to to stay to the end uh, she's got the irish in her so she's used to those uh, longer goodbyes thank you kathleen uh, you and i need to chat again and catch up on things Love you all. You guys take care. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Hope you enjoyed this uh, Monday evening. Again, if like I had said earlier at the top of the show, if you weren't having a good day, hopefully the time we spent together maybe perked you up a little bit so you can tackle the next day. And if it already is the next day, for those of you in Australia, New Zealand, and elsewhere, well, I hope you have a good day. We will see you tomorrow, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, right here on the Gym Master Show Live. I'll be here waiting for you with our glass full of whatever, cast of characters, and another great guest, and lots of levity coming your way. That's what it's all about. I hope you're here too. If you're not, well, we will uh, have these shows all available in the archives at uh, Gym Masters TV, and we'll see you on the next one. June, XOXO, -O, o -X, o -X, she flipped it around, OX, 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 OX. <laughs> If you can count all the O's and X's, you win the car. Um, Linda says, and you as well, uh, uh, OXXO, OXXO to you as well, June. Hope y'all have a good evening. I love that. I love the y'all. Linda O'Dell, love you too. Good stuff, good stuff. All right, gang. We will see you later. Karen Campbell Greenholz, also one of our terrific loveties. Hey, Jim, and all loveties. Karen. There in beautiful Nova Scotia. You have a great night as well, and thank you for joining us. We're signing off, folks. Jim Masters, thanking you for your time this time. Till next time, we'll see you tomorrow right here. I hope you'll join us. If not, we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Take care. Love you all. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.